Hey lightweights, here's what you can expect from today's episode of Mass Effect. This second parent, however, may be of any species and any gender. Oh. Uh, um... Did I accidentally start on a romance path? I mean, Caden, you're cute, but you're a boring human, no offense. We have hot aliens we could romance instead. I didn't like how she said those. I have to go. <laughs> Alright, see ya. I hope we didn't leave on bad terms. Alright guys, so in today's video, um, I have a lot of catching up to do in terms of talking to people on the ship, finishing the codex, and then a lot of exploration of the citadel. So I thought today's video would be more of that side of things, because I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything, I'm not missing dialogue. Um, a lot of you have said that I'm missing a lot because I'm fast traveling in the citadel. I didn't realize I didn't have to, if you recall in one of the videos I asked if that was a thing, if I had to or if I could walk through the whole thing. You guys informed me I can walk through the entire citadel and that there's a lot of side stuff and dialogue and stuff that I um, should look for. So I'm going to talk to everybody on my ship first, finish up the codex, and then I'll go back to the citadel before doing any other main missions uh, because I don't want to get locked out of anything. Now that's not guaranteeing I'm going to find everything, <laughs> um, but this video is going to kind of just be a catch-up lore dialogue video. So if that's not your thing, feel free to like fast forward through it. Um, but that is the game plan for today. Uh, so yeah, let's start off with... I don't even remember what my main objective is right now because it's been so long since I recorded, so I'm just... <laughs> one second. <laughs> Home colony, investigate what Saren was after. Okay, and it looks like I have some points, so I might as well use those as well. Um, I think, if I recall, a couple of you recommended putting more into shotguns. Um, so I think I'm going to put these here. Turns next shotgun blast into an explosive ball of particles that can damage multiple enemies. All right, and then we'll do one more in charm, just for good measure. All right, um... We did that one already. We did that one, we did that one. Military jargon. Okay, so I did all of those. In the early 21s, the Krogan evolved in a hostile and vicious environment. Okay, we did this one already. Until the invention of gunpowder weapons, eaten by yes, we did that one driven from their home system by the Geth nearly three centuries ago. Most quarians now that one as well. Okay. After the Geth, Thresher Maws are subterranean carnivores that spend their entire lives eating. Did that one already? <laughs> Sorry, <The> guys. <laughs> Citadel space is an unofficial term referring to any region of space controlled by a species that acknowledges the authority of the Citadel Council. At first glance, it appears this territory encompasses most of the galaxy. In reality, however, less than 1% of the stars have been explored. I think we did this Even one too, but... Mass Effect FTL drive is slow relative to the volume of the galaxy. Empty space and systems without suitable drive discharge sites are barriers to exploration. We definitely did. That's okay. Only the mass relays allow ships to jump hundreds of light years in an instant. The key to expanding across an otherwise impassable galaxy. Whenever a new relay is activated, the destination system is rapidly developed. From that hub, FTL drive is used to expand to nearby star clusters. The result is a number of densely developed clusters, thinly spread across the vast expanse of space, connected by the mass relay network. The Systems Alliance is an independent supranational government representing the interests of humanity as a whole. The Alliance is responsible for the governance and defense of all extrasolar colonies and stations. 
The alliance grew out of the various national space programs as a matter of practicality. Sol's planets had been explored and exploited through piecemeal national efforts. The expense of colonizing entire new solar systems could not be met by any one country. With humans knowing that alien contact was inevitable, there was enough political will to jointly fund an international effort. Still, the alliance was often disregarded by those on Earth until the first contact war. While the national governments dithered and bickered over who should lead the effort to liberate Shanxi, the alliance fleet struck decisively. Post-war public approval gave the alliance the credibility to establish its own parliament and become the galactic face of humanity. Pharos is a habitable world in the Attic and Beta Cluster. Two-thirds of the habitable surface is covered with the ruins of a crumbling Prothean megatropolis. In the millennia since the Prothean extinction, the ruins have been repeatedly picked over by looters many times. Pharos was considered a poor prospect for colonization, as little open ground remains for agriculture. The only sizable freshwater sources are the poles, which are tapped by the decaying Prothean aqueduct systems. The dead cities, while in good condition considering their antiquity, are of uncertain stability. Ground level is congested by a dozen meters of fallen debris, and the air is fouled by dust. In 2178, the human Exogeny Corporation announced its intention to place a permanent colony on Pharos to thoroughly explore the ruins. The pioneer settlement was placed on the upper levels of several intact skyscrapers, using the surviving Prothean aqueducts and rooftop hydroponic gardens to support the population. That's really cool. Novaria is a cool, rocky world <laughs> with most of its hydrosphere it's locked cool. <laughs> up in massive glaciers. A privately chartered colony world, the planet is owned by the Novaria Development Corporation Holding Company. The NDC is funded by investment capital from two dozen high technology development firms and administrated by an executive board representing their interests. The investors built remote hot labs in isolated locations across Novaria's surface. These facilities are used for research too dangerous or controversial to be performed elsewhere, as Novaria is technically not part of Citadel space and therefore exempt from council law. Oh, so they're doing By special shit arrangement, there. Citadel's special tactics and reconnaissance agents have been granted extraterritorial privileges, but it remains to be seen how committed the executive board is to that principle. Given its unique situation, it is understandable that Novaria is often implicated in all manner of wild conspiracy theories. They're definitely doing some real shady shit there. The Terminus. There are between two and four hundred billion stars in the galaxy, and less than one percent of them have ever been visited or had their systems properly surveyed. Humanity's early expansion into the Attican Traverse was haphazard a desperate race to claim habitable planets where populations can be economically settled. Ignored in the wake of this land grab were thousands of less hospitable worlds, each potentially rich with industrial resources. The wealth of entire solar systems lies untapped, waiting for corporate survey teams or independent pioneers to discover and exploit them. However, this is not an easy task. In addition to the environmental hazards, the fact that uncharted worlds are largely ignored makes them popular bases for criminals, revolutionaries, cults, and others who wish to remain unnoticed by galactic society. It'd be cool if we had to find a cult on one of these islands. A virtual intelligence is an advanced form of user interface software. VIs use a variety of methods to simulate natural conversation, including an audio interface, and an avatar personality to interact with. Although a VI can provide a convincing emulation of sentience, they are not self-aware, nor can they learn or take independent action. VIs are used as operating systems on commercial and home computers. Minimal VI agents are also available. Agents are compact and specialized. Some serve as personal secretaries, filtering calls and scheduling meetings based on user-defined priorities. Others are advanced search engines, propagating themselves across the extranet to collate user-requested data. Commercial VIs in a variety of stock personalities are available at any software retailer. Boutique firms and hobbyists also build unique VIs to personal specification. 
Although software emulation of living personalities is illegal, reconstructions of famous historical figures are common. It's like it could be a super intense version of a deep fake. A virtual intelligence is combat hard. All modern infantry weapons, from pistols to assault rifles, use micro-scaled mass accelerator technology. Oh. Projectiles consist of tiny metal slugs suspended within a mass-reducing field, accelerated by magnetic force to speeds that inflict kinetic damage. That's the cool. ammo magazine is a simple block of metal. The gun's internal computer calculates the mass needed to reach the target based on distance, gravity, and atmospheric pressure. Damn. then shears off an appropriate sized slug from the block. A single block can supply thousands of rounds, making ammo a non-issue during any engagement. Top-line weapons also feature smart targeting that allows them to correct for weather and environment. Firing on a target in a howling gale feels the same as it does on a calm day at the practice range. Smart targeting does not mean a bullet will automatically find the mark every time the trigger is pulled. It only makes it easier for the marksman to aim. Hmm. Okay. Very, very cool. All right, let's go find people to talk to. Okay, thwarted already. <laughs> I'm gonna start at the back and work my way forward. That way. Wait, down. Am I already at the back? <laughs> this is already going very well, you guys. Okay, I'm gonna start down and then I'll work my way up. Okay. This is going really well so far, you guys. Dr. Chakwas, I can talk to you. Yes, Commander? Is there something you need? How well do you know the Lieutenant? I'd never worked with him before this mission. But he has an impressive service record. Over a dozen special commendations. Tends to keep to himself, though. Maybe because of the headaches. It's not easy being an L2. What does that have to do with it? Well, most biotics now use the L3 implants. Lieutenant Alenko was wired with the old L2 configuration. Sometimes there are complications. Why did that happen? Is it like the amount of money he had? What kind of complications? Severe mental disabilities, insanity, crippling physical pain. There's a long list of horrific side effects. Caden's lucky. He just gets migraines. Oh my god. How did you end up serving on an Alliance ship? I enlisted right out of med school. Earth always seemed boring to me. Too safe, too secure. I figured the colonies were teeming with exotic adventure. I wanted to travel the stars, tending the wounds of tough soldiers with piercing eyes and sensitive souls. <laughs> Turns out military life isn't quite as romantic as I'd imagined. But humanity needs the Alliance if we want to keep expanding through the Traverse. And the Alliance always needs good doctors. So I stayed on to do my part. Ever think you made the wrong choice? Sometimes I think about opening a private practice back on Earth. Or maybe taking a position at one of the new med centers out in the colonies. But there's something special about working on soldiers. If I left the Alliance now, I'd feel like I was abandoning them. I should go. Goodbye, Commander. Hi, Liara. Commander, are you coming to check up on me? You look much better. How are you feeling? Dr. Chakwas assures me I am going to be fine. I was impressed with her knowledge of Asari physiology. Um, so thank you guys for confirming what I thought about this being like... Paragon and Renegade. I didn't know the names of them, but... You guys informed me of them. I think I'm gonna stick to the Paragon. Um, Renegade playthrough would probably be a lot of fun, but for my first time, I feel like I'm more of a Paragon leaning. So I'm gonna go into the Paragon like intensely, even if that's not necessarily what I 
would typically say um, because I want to get those par Paragon dialogue options that you guys were telling me about. Um, I don't know if these are Paragon or Re Renegade at this point, but just in general, you know what I mean. You're in good hands. Dr. Chakwas knows what she's doing. I never properly thanked you for saving me from the Geth Commander. If you hadn't shown up, I... See, this seems like it should be backwards. <laughs> I'm just glad we got there in time. So am I. I know you took a chance bringing me aboard this ship. I have seen the way your crew looks at me. They do not trust me. But I am not like Benezia. I will do whatever I can to help you stop Saren. I promise. Don't worry, Liara. I trust you. I know you won't let me down. It means a lot to hear you say that, Commander. Thank you. Tell me about yourself, Liara. Me? I am afraid I am not very interesting, Commander. I spend most of my time on remote digs, unearthing mundane items buried in long-forgotten Prothean ruins. Uh, you must get lonely. Sounds dangerous. And lonely. Uh. <laughs> Sometimes I would run afoul of indigenous life forms or stumble across a small band of mercenaries or privateers. But I was always careful. Until the Geth followed me to Artemis Tau. I never found myself in any situation my biotics could not handle. As for the solitude, well, that is one aspect that most appealed to me. Sometimes I just need to get away from other people. I get that. You don't like other people? I suppose it comes from being a matriarch's daughter. People expected me to follow in Benezia's footsteps. They wanted me to become a leader of our people. Matriarchs guide their followers into the future. They seek the truth of what is yet to come. Maybe that's why I became so interested in the secrets of the past. It sounds so foolish when I say it out loud. It sounds like I became an archaeologist simply to spite Benezia. All children rebel against their parents. It's a natural part of growing up. Uh -huh. You share the wisdom of the matriarch, Shepard. That is exactly what Benezia said when I told her of my decision. But there was more to it than that. I felt drawn to the past. The Protheans were these wondrous, mysterious figures. I wanted to know everything about them. That is why I find you so fascinating. You were marked by the beacon on Eden Prime. Oh. You were touched by working Prothean technology. Sounds like you want to dissect me in a lab somewhere. What? No! I did not mean to insinuate. Uh, I never meant to offend you, Shepard. I only meant that you would be an interesting specimen for an in-depth study. Uh, no, that's even worse. Calm down, Liara. I was only joking. Joking? Oh, by the goddess! How could I be so dense? You must think I am a complete and utter fool. <sighs> oh, now Liara. you know why I prefer to spend my time in the field with data disks and computers. I always seem to say something embarrassing around other people. Please, just pretend this conversation never happened. <laughs> Do you know why Benezia joined up with Saren? I don't understand it. She was always outspoken about the need for the Asari to become more involved in shaping galactic events. Maybe she thought allying herself with Saren would somehow be for the greater good in the long run. At least I hope so. This hurts you, doesn't it? None of this makes any sense to me. I have not spoken to Benezia in many years, but I know her. And this was not like her. Something changed. Interesting. <clears throat> As I randomly lose my voice. So now I'm curious to see what she was like beforehand and if something was actually like done to her. Like, did she encounter a piece of weird technology that altered her? Did Saren convince her? Did she go of her own volition? That sort of thing. I'd like to know more about the Asari. We were the first species to discover the Citadel. We were instrumental in forming the Council. And we always strive to be the voice of peaceful cooperation in galactic disputes. Until now. My people believe we are all part of a single galactic community. Each species contributes something to the greater whole. Although we seek to understand other species, it seems few of them seek to understand us. The galaxy is filled with rumors and misinformation about my people. Like what? Most of the inaccuracies are centered around our mating rituals. My species is monogendered. Male and female have no real meaning for us. We hmm. still require a partner to reproduce. This second parent, however, may be of any species and any gender. Oh. 
That's disgusting. I don't understand. Your species can mate with anyone? Mating is not quite the proper term. Not as you understand it. Physical contact may or may not be involved. But it is not an essential element of the Union. The what? true connection is mental. Our physiology allows us to meld with other beings. We can touch the very depths of their minds. We explore the genetic memory of their species. We share the most basic elements of their individual and racial identities. We then pass these traits on to our daughters. It is how we learn to grow as a species and how we develop a greater understanding of other races. What happens to your partner after the union? Every relationship is different. Some unions are a single encounter with both parents parting ways afterwards. Others can be more long term. Sometimes an Asari and her partner will stay together for many decades. So do they all... She said they're monogendered. But do they all present female? Because then she said our daughters. So it makes me think they all present female and then they... just don't classify themselves as female because there are no males? That doesn't seem right, but I'm confused by the line about when she talks about her daughters. Do you know who Matriarch Benezia chose as her partner? She rarely spoke of her partner. Though I know my father, if you want to use that term, was another Asari. I thought you always needed another species to serve as one of the parents. Think about it, Shepard. If we were not able to mate with our own species, we would have died out long before we ever mastered spaceflight and left our homeworld. Union with our own kind is no longer common, not for the purposes of reproduction. Most Asari believe it weakens our species. Asari daughters inherit racial traits from the father species. If both parents are Asari, then nothing has been gained, or so conventional wisdom would hold. I am what is sometimes called a pureblood. Though no Asari would ever be cruel enough to say the word to my face, it is a great insult among my people. That's the opposite of most things. Benezia's partner was embarrassed by their union. She may have been too ashamed to publicly acknowledge me as her offspring. Maybe she wanted to meet you but couldn't. If something could have happened to her. Maybe she passed away. You might be right. I hope you are. But I have no way to know for sure. Benezia never spoke of her partner. Whatever happened, it caused her too much pain to dwell on it. She raised me by herself, though that is not uncommon. Many Asari raise their children alone, particularly if the father species is short-lived. Often the partner will pass on long before the child reaches maturity. Alright, so we already did who is your father. How do they deal with that? That kind of sounds a little harsh. You Asari live for a thousand years. What happens when your partner dies? Few sapient species live as long as my kind. We have learned to take a philosophical approach to our unions. We do not focus on the inevitable loss of our partners. Instead, we enjoy the time we spend with them. And even after they're gone, a part of them lives on in us. The union is a connection that transcends both time and space. So it does sound like they are all... They are all, like, female presenting, even if they're not technically female. I should go. Goodbye, Shepard. That was interesting. We're gonna have a lot more codex entries to catch up on. <laughs> Caden, how's your head? Commander, do you have a minute? I always make time for my officers. Off the record, I think there's something wrong here. This Saren is looking for records on some kind of galactic extinction, but we can't get backup from the council? Sorry, Commander. There's writing on the wall here, but someone isn't reading it. The council doesn't want to believe anything's wrong. I'd call it human nature, but... I hear you. It, it just seems like a group that's been around as long as the council should see this coming. It's funny, we finally get out here and the final frontier was already settled. 
and the residents don't even seem impressed by the view or the dangers. Well, well, you're a romantic. Did you sign on for the dream, Malenko? Secure a man's future in space? <laughs> yeah, I, re I read a lot of those books when I was a kid where the hero goes to space to prove himself worthy of a woman he loves or, you know, for justice. Or <laughs> something that sounds more macho. <laughs> I thought about it after brain camp. Uh, sorry. Biotic acclimation and temperance training. I'm not looking for the dream. I just want to do some good. See what's out here. Sorry if I got too informal. Protocol wasn't a big focus back in Bot. Tell me about it. Biotic acclimation and temperance didn't last past the airlock. To the kids they hauled in, it was brain camp. Sorry, hauled in is unkind. We were encouraged to commit to an evaluation of our abilities so an understanding of biotics could be compiled. There are worse results of accidental exposure to element zero in the womb. Beats the brain tumors some kids grew up with. So I remember that the element zero is what gave them their powers, but do they also have like implants or chips or something? Because Chakwa said that he has the, the version two and not the version three. Is there some question about how you were exposed? Hmm. My mother was downwind of a transport crash. It was before there were human biotics, a little after the discovery of the Martian ruins. It only gets iffy around 63 when Kinetics was running out of first-gen subjects. Until then, they'd relied on accidentals. A bunch of guys in suits show up at your door after school, and next thing you know, you're out on Jump Zero. Jump Zero is Gagarin Station, right? What's it like? Yeah, that's the official name. Biggest and farthest facility we had for decades. Right on the termination shock, the outer edge of the solar system. It's where they did all the goose chase FTL research before we caught on to using mass effect fields. It was a sterile research platform when I was there. You know of any intentional exposures for certain? No one knows. Doesn't mean they didn't happen. As big as the exposures were, it was hard to track down accidentals. It was different then. No one knew the potential, so there wasn't a lot of regulation. Anything Kinetics did was gold. I'm not saying they intentionally detonated drives over our outposts, but in retrospect, they were damn quick on the scene. It definitely sounds fishy. I'll give him that. And especially if they had just discovered that there, that people could get those abilities from exposure and then they wanted to harness them as soldiers or experiments or something like that, I could 100% see accidental train derailments or things of that nature. I only say train derailments because we've had a bunch of those in the United States recently. I'm not being a conspiracy theory and saying those were intentional. I'm just, it was a bad, forget I said it, it was a bad comparison. <laughs> accidental rocket explosions. There were other kids in the same boat, right? At least you weren't alone out there. That's true. We did have a little circle that'd get together every night before lights out. We didn't have much to do, though. It was a research platform then, and Kinetics kept Jump Zero off the extranet to prevent leaks. Time to get physical, then. <sighs> then you must have had plenty of time to get to know each other. Yeah. We'd sit around and bowl every night after dinner and play cards or network games. There was this girl named Rana, who had a little circle grow up around her. She was from Turkey, her family was very rich. But she was smart, and charming as hell. Beautiful, but not stuck up about it. Like you, I guess. Yeah. Sounds rough, go on. <laughs> Sounds like she was special to you. She was. Maybe she felt the same. Things never felt together. Training, you know. I think I got all of the investigation, but yeah, okay. Jump Zero is a long way from home. What was it like? The grand gateway to humanity looks a lot better in the vids. Anyway, this was supposed to be a casual debrief, not a bull session about stuff that happened years ago. 
I wanted to get to know you a little better. That's all. Thanks for the talk, Caden. Well, you're welcome, ma'am. You, uh, make a habit of getting this personal with everyone? Was he asking for interested in him? No, no I don't. We'll talk again later. I'll, uh, I'll need some time to process that, Commander. But, yeah, I'd like that. Uh, um... Did I accidentally start down a romance path? I mean, Caden, you're cute, but you're a boring human. No offense. We have hot aliens we could romance instead. Ah, seems like a very comfortable bed. Okay, I couldn't talk to those guys. So let's go back up now. Again, I'm going to start at the back and work my way forward, but there's nothing here, so... <laughs> we'll examine that for the codex entry, and... Moving on. Okay, I can talk to Navigator Presley. If anyone has to take over for Captain Anderson, I'm glad it's you. I'm not sure about having non-humans on our ship, though. We're all on the same team here, Presley. With all due respect, ma'am, that's what they said about Nihilus. Look how that turned out. I'm in charge here, Presley. I decide if we have non-humans on this vessel. Yes, ma'am. Understood, ma'am. That's better. <laughs> Speak freely, Presley. I want to know if you have a problem with non-humans. It's not that, Commander. <laughs> it didn't Humanity has always handled its own problems. Saren attacked one of our colonies. We should be the ones to stop it. We don't need their help. Some people think asking for help is a sign of weakness. That's just being stupid and stubborn. No matter how strong you are, allies can make you stronger. I guess so. Maybe I'm just stuck in the old ways of thinking. But don't worry, Commander. This won't be a problem. I don't remember his name, but he looks like that, um... I think he was like the second in command in Battlestar Galactica, like the, the newer one, not the original. I don't remember what his character name was, though. I haven't watched it in so long. How did you end up assigned to the Normandy? I signed up with the Alliance as a navigator right out of school, following in my grandfather's footsteps, I guess. My first posting was on the Agincourt. We were one of the first reinforcements to arrive at Elysium after the Blitz hit. <laughs> Those raiders were no match for an Alliance frigate. Of course, the only reason the colony was still standing was because of you, Commander. I can't believe you held out as long as you did. How'd you end up on the Normandy? I got my officer's commission after Elysium. Must have made an impression on the right people. Captain asked for me when he was picking his crew. Carry on, Presley. Yes, ma'am. What? Wait, why'd I get renegade points? <laughs> Oops. What a view. I, I prefer gold to silver, you know, for my metal. I figured you'd recommend me for one since I uh, pulled your boots out of the fire. If we present you with a medal, you'll end up sitting on stage listening to politicians make speeches for a couple of hours. That's a good point. They'd probably make me shave, too. I spent the last seven weeks working on this baby. 
No medal's worth that. <laughs> so, Commander, why don't you tell me why you're really here? I like to know my crew. Mind if I ask you a few questions? <laughs> I can see where this is going. You did a background check on me, didn't you? Well, I'll tell you the same thing I told the captain. You want me as your pilot. I'm not good. I'm not even great. I am the best damn helmsman in the Alliance fleet. Top of my class in flight school, I earned that. All those commendations in my file, I earned every single one. Those weren't given to me as charity for my disease. I'm sorry, Joker. I didn't even know you were sick. You mean... You mean you didn't know? <laughs> oh, crap. Okay, what disease? I've got Froelich syndrome, brittle bone disease. The bones in my legs never develop properly. They're basically hollow, too much force, and they'll shatter. Even with crutches and my leg braces, it's hard to get around. One wrong step and crack! It's very dramatic. But I've learned to manage my condition, Commander. Put the Normandy in my hands and I'll make her dance for you. Just don't ask me to get up and dance unless, you know, you like the sound of snapping shin bones. No oh, thanks. Why does everyone call you Joker? It's a lot shorter than saying Alliance Flight Lieutenant Jeff Moreau. Plus, I love to make little children laugh. I was just thinking how much you remind me of Santa Claus. <laughs> Look, I didn't pick the name. One of the instructors in flight school used to bug me about never smiling. She started calling me Joker, and it stuck. Why didn't you ever smile? Hey, I worked my ass off in flight school, Commander. The world's not gonna hand you anything if you go around grinning like an idiot. By the end of the year, I was the best pilot in the academy. Even better than the instructors, and everybody knew it. They'd all got their asses kicked by the sickly kid with the creaky little legs. One guess who was smiling at graduation. How's the Normandy performing? Is she everything they said she'd be? She's the best ship in the fleet. If you've got a pilot who knows how to handle her. Balance isn't what you'd expect. It takes a while to get used to that oversized drive core we got stuffed in the back, and her power can sneak up on you if you're not careful. The Normandy's probably too much ship for your average Alliance pilot, Commander. Lucky for you, I'm anything but average. I need to know more about this Rolex Syndrome if I'm putting my ship in your hands. Ugh. Of course you do. It's an extremely rare condition. Nobody no. knows exactly what causes it. Genetic, maybe. It's treatable, but there's no cure. They classify my case as moderate to severe. I was born with over a dozen fractures. Hip, thighs, ankles. My bones were already breaking in the womb. A hundred years ago, I wouldn't have survived past my first year. Lucky for me, modern medical science has turned me into a productive member of society. You're not gonna break a bone trying to fly the ship, are you? Uh, I don't fly with my feet, Commander. So I'm fine as long as I'm in this chair. I gotta be real careful when I get up to take a piss, though. I can do my job as well as anyone on the ship. Better, actually. So don't worry about it. I... I didn't like how she said those. I have to go. <laughs> Alright, see ya. I hope we didn't leave on bad terms. This looks like an elevator. Why can't I use it? Hello? Okay. I'm missing... I'm missing some crewmates, so there's gotta be more of my ship. Oh my god. The ship is tiny and I'm already lost. Maybe this elevator can take me where I need to go. Going down, that's a good sign. Oh wow, yeah, look at all this. Okay. Start back here. Oh shit! Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive core like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. 
The Normandy's a prototype, cutting edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a Quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Geth. I can't believe the fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. Hmm, makes sense. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. My question is going to be, do they always accept? Can a captain choose to reject the gift? Uh, that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I was gonna ask about that. I'm like, okay, if they accept everybody, then why wouldn't you just go out and be like, here's a strawberry? Like, I, <laughs> I can't believe they just send you off alone. It's not like they just cast us out. Before we leave, we are given lessons in how to survive outside the flotilla, and given gifts to help us on our journey. We also receive implants to fight off sickness and disease. Generations of living in an isolated and highly controlled environment have left our immune systems weaker than most. By the time we leave the fleet, we are well equipped for the pilgrimage. This is a rite of passage for all Quarians. If it were dangerous, our numbers would suffer. Virtually every pilgrimage ends with a triumphant return and the ritual presentation of the gift to one of the fleet's captains. So is that why she wears... I want to talk about something else. The outfit she wears, or like is that what? more, like, due to her... her race? I want to know more about the gift. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. How come the Council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them, or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So the Geth share brain power? 
Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in the group, the smarter they are. Oh, so it's not like one mothership Geth doing the thinking for all of them. It's just, it's like more pieces of the puzzle fitting together, making a better looking picture. So there's some sort of group consciousness. No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous That's input. good. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. I think I get it, but I want to hear what she has to say, so I'm going to say I don't get it. I'm probably oversimplifying. The Geth are incredibly advanced and complex creations. All you need to know is that they get smarter when they gather in large numbers. As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? That's never good. As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. I don't see what's so bad about those questions. The Geth were created to engage in <laughs> mundane, repetitive, or dangerous manual labor. That's fine for machines, but it won't satisfy a sentient being for long. The Geth were showing signs of rudimentary self-awareness and independent thought. If the Geth were intelligent, then we were essentially using them as slaves. It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. Hey, you can't blame them for fighting for their survival. We had no other choice. The Geth were already on the verge of revolution. By acting quickly, we had a chance to end the war before it began. Or... The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Now, we drift through space, Exile, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. Or, 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 hear me out. You could have just like uh, treated them like you would another race, and like paid them and freed them. And I mean, I know that's easier said than done when your entire economy is based on using them like that. But just you know, probably would have spared you from fighting and death. Just saying. Uh, okay, so. Is this side the Paragon and Renegade side? Because it's very much feeling like that. And now I'm like regretting some of the things that I said because I thought I was just getting more information and now I'm like, oh, no wonder that was so harsh because that was the Renegade side. I was actually being a bitch. Oh man. Every time I think I'm understanding. <laughs> it's hard to feel sorry for you. Your ancestors tried to wipe out another species. What? We made a mistake when we created the Geth in the first place, but we did not make a mistake when we went to war against them. If we had not acted, they would have wiped us out. They're a synthetic life form. They have no use for organics. None. Why do you think they cut themselves off from the rest of the galaxy? Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them? I didn't mean to offend you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get so worked up. Most Quarians tend to have pretty strong opinions about the Geth. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla. 
and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. So I'm curious, with a flotilla, I think of a bunch of little ships working together. So is it like a bunch of smaller spaceships, or are they just on one gigundo ship? I'm picturing like a bunch of smaller ships just kind of like traversing space together. That's your government. The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative okay. to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So I wonder if you can choose, like, when you come back from your thing, do you go back onto the ship that you left, or can you choose what ship you want to go to? Because I almost feel like it would get a little, like, incestual if you just kept going back to the same ship. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials? In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. I should go. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> okay. Hey, Commander, you know that Quarian Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. I didn't. <laughs> I figured she'd be a real asset to the team. You've got an eye for talent, Commander. But I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Fill me in on the IES stealth system. How does it work exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up. Unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself. No emissions to give away our location. Eventually the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up to FTL, blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTO flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. I feel like that's probably not true. We might think we have the only one. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on, probably the fastest vessel ever designed. She's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Core. What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Where else have you served, Adams? If you name a class of Alliance ship, I've probably served on it. 
Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo, only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. Those exits are always so awkward. All right, guys. So unfortunately, I do have to stop there. We are basically at an hour. Um, I know I still have at least three other people on the ship to talk to. Uh, I have Garrus, Rex, and Ashley. And then I don't know if there's anybody else that's just on the ship that I can talk to. So still have a couple more people. I did not get back to the Citadel. So that will be a next video adventure. <laughs> um, so I'll finish talking to those last three. I will catch up on the codex again because I know I got a lot of new codex entries and then I do plan on going to the Citadel, like I said earlier, um, to walk around and try to pick up any side quests. Um, yes, so I think that'll be fun. I don't know if I'll get all that done next video either, so this might be like a couple videos of trying to get caught up, um, but then once I am caught up with that or feel pretty caught up with that, um, I'll be more comfortable like balancing them and going back and forth but like I said at the beginning of this video I really want to make sure that I don't get locked out of anything um, and I'm sure I'm gonna miss some things unintentionally this is my first time playing this I can't have a perfect playthrough um, but I want to try my best not to so once I get caught up as best I can I've explored the Citadel I think I found everything that I think I'm going to find um, then I can do some main missions go back to the citadel some main missions go back to the citadel so um i think that will be my game plan going forward in the future so if you are someone who doesn't really care about these things you've played this a million times and you don't want to hear their conversations again um just know that next video will probably be a little bit more of the same potentially two more videos <laughs> depending on how long it takes me to get through these three people and the codex because then by the time i get to the citadel there might not be very much time um but I am loving these conversations. I really am learning a ton about everything. <laughs> There's just so much lore. Um, my favorite is definitely talking to like the characters of our team, um, learning about their race, their way of thinking. It's just very, very cool. Um, I think I accidentally started some like romantic stuff with Caden that was totally unintentional. I'm not mad about it, but also like. If I can choose romance options, Caden's great, but you know, we gotta go with an alien. <laughs> so uh, not, I hope that didn't like mess me up for anything further down the road. I don't know if you can have like multiple romantic things going on or not. Um, so that was my only like, oops, I hope I didn't mess that up. And also, I guess I'm still confused about the Renegade and Paragon. I thought the right hand side, the top was Paragon, the bottom was Renegade, but there were times I was getting Renegade and Paragon points and I was like, I didn't even realize I was choosing those types of dialogues. So I guess if you guys could explain that one more time, apparently it's taking a minute to actually process. Because there was a couple times where the left hand side seemed like a Renegade or a Paragon, but then at the end of the conversation, I didn't get any of those points, but they definitely seemed really harsh. Like the whole conversation with Joker. And I don't know if I got Renegade points for that or not. I don't remember at this point. But anyways, I'm definitely loving our crewmates. They are all super interesting. Um, and I'm really excited to keep playing with them and learning more about them um, and kind of unlocking their relationships. Because you can already see like with Tali, for example, I don't know her very well. So it still was like, more formal, a little bit strained, but with Caden it felt much more like, okay, we're already romancing each other on accident. <laughs> so I feel like we'll be able to see the progress of their relationship um, as the game continues, and I'm really excited for that. So I hope you enjoyed this catch-up video. Um, I would love to give like more insight into things, but I don't really have a ton of that right now, I think because there's just so much to process and learn. Um, I'm sure those conversations, though, will help me have more insights as we progress and do other things, which I think that's kind of when it will come more in handy. Um, but at this point, I don't have anything super smart or witty to say, so I'm just going to end there. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell button when you do so that you know when I post future videos. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it, and I hope you have an amazing day.